What is dance? What is dance? What is that moment when you call human moment, movement as dance and not as movement? It's also the same thing in music. Not all sound is music, but would there be music without sound? Etc., etc. And the same thing with language. The language of ordinary discourse, what we're talking, is not poetry. But the same word set in another organizational structure, not necessarily just rhyme and meter, would become poetry. So what is it that distinguishes it? It is once again, it is that inspiration of giving the ordinary extraordinariness. My gesture can be a simple gesture like this, which can be an ordinary gesture, it can be a very mundane gesture. But the moment this gesture, I give it a certain meaning of communication. The hand is still in this and I it becomes a dance movement. What is it that I have done here? I have abstracted that in terms of its ordinariness to give it some quality which will communicate depersonalized, let's put it like this. And dance is that capacity of, it is in animals, there is the dance of peacocks, there is the dance of birds, there is the dance of animals, of fish, of whatever, that the sense of rhythm in pure corporal frame, which is imbued with a sense of release at the spiritual or the emotive, makes something dance. And that dance is, to my mind, the finest where the subjective self is not being expressed. And where, as Yeats said, that there is the dancer, no dancer. dance is concerned with the body in a way, but is using the body only as an instrument, an instrument in which the body itself is abstracted. And the Indian dancer's concern is with really trying to transcend time through time and also to remain with gravity. Indian dance, almost like Indian music, is concerned with the minutest movements which can be contained in time or rhythmic cycles of time in order to transcend time. And this is the paradox with which we are dealing with. Western dance is trying to free itself from gravity. All those great leaps and jumps that you have in ballet. It is trying to cover as much space as possible. And it is, its concern is with both material space and mental space. All arts, but dance is certainly that state of release, even if it is a momentary release. But if you've had that experience once, you do the same movement every day. 
and then one day you know that it happened. The center run by Kapila Vatsayan is linked with other people and institutions working with the same spirit in the West. In January 1997, the center organized a dialogue among people who were trying to understand clearly the significance of tradition. Tradition is always on the move. Society has to assimilate new ideas, but at the same time, it has to base itself on its own past experience. What we're trying to do here is exactly to make this bridge between the textual and the oral traditions. Because one part of the knowledge was transmitted and a very great part of both knowledge as also wisdom, now to speak of information, to oral transmission. The other, much later, was transmitted to the written word. So our programs here are absolutely interlocked, that while we are exploring the textual traditions, we have a complementary program on exploring the oral traditions. What naturally happens, and this is what is the uh, condition by the 20th century, that that which is in the textual traditions, in its output, comes out as a written work. And so you see our 20 volumes on the different texts. What do we do with our work in the oral traditions? If we put it in a book, then it becomes already a written. It doesn't. So we have about 12 field programs going on in different parts of India, in which we are exploring both aspects of semantics, vocabulary, language, expression, more, because the oral traditions are situated in context and they are with the life situation. So we have called them really lifestyle studies. And then the output of this is in a series of films which we are doing. And we made four films already, one on the Metes in Manipur, then on the, in Meghale, and then the, there is, um, we're doing something in South India, and alongside, we're doing a great deal of recording of technical knowledge which is transmitted orally, which ranges from Vedic, transmission intonation system. And we've done a 40-hour recording of the different streams of Vedic recitation. And as much as we can, because one of the things about oral transmission is that these formulas and everything in which you know, which Ellis Bonner has also said in her writing, these are secret. And in terms of the skills part of it. So while we have done some recording of artisans in terms of how they transmit knowledge and skill, I'm unable to make them or I'm duty bound not to make it public just now. But I'm very conscious of the richness of the oral traditions in India. And we're trying to do what we can.
we're thinking of a collective which is seeing life phenomena or universal phenomena in terms of certain sustained metaphors. These sustained metaphors are then concretized through different formal values as which we recognize as symbols sometimes or we recognize in a ritual as a language of that. And this collectively becomes the images of a culture. Now to keep to the Indian tradition for a minute, as illustration, in terms of its metaphors, it saw its rivers as goddesses. It saw the trees as deities, which happened in Greek mythology to a point. It saw emptiness as the full jar, kumbha. It saw the intertwined snake as the continuity of time and cyclic time. It saw the image of man as a principle of the universe in its interconnectedness of the parts and the whole. It saw a man-woman relationship in terms of the principles of static and dynamism, or stillness and movement. Was It saw seed as general growth and reseeding, and therefore the temple begins from the, or the stupa begins from the seed and goes, and the upper part is again the seed. It saw the metaphor of the womb, womb house, or, and that womb was that secret, potent, unmanifest, which manifested itself in all its diversity. This was imagery, imagery which you see in poetry on the walls of Indian temples or stupas, or you see it in Indian painting, you see it, you see the seasons as sung in Indian music, or, and you see it in dance. Can you compare this with the imagery or the images that you see in mass media today? I think it is disruptive, it is intrusive, it is, it is, uh, it fragments you because you're living from moment to moment to moment. And as all the mass media people tell you, you know, there can't be any more attention beyond three minutes and you must not do anything after. Are we, are we morons of a kind that we cannot keep concentration beyond three minutes? I'm being told every day, Madam, not more than three minutes. You know, people cannot. Retention is, I don't know which brain theory people talk about. So what is this about this imagery that the imagery has to move? Before I've taken it in, it is gone. Even my retina cannot take it physically. Second and more important and devastating is the attitude towards the body and the senses. Because both these are being used, the figurative human form, as also sensibilities for arousing sensation, but not for refining. I mean, this is an extreme statement I'm making. There are very fine. Uh, very fine uh, departures, and one could think in terms of the imagery that has been created by some of the films of Bergman, 
the imagery created by Rosalini, the imagery that has been created by some of the greatest films from Europe. Yes, we're not talking about that, but we are talking about the general uh, imagery of consumer culture. connection with the mythical world and no reality is worth living as far as I'm concerned unless uh, it is a myth which gives it the meaning and man and this is global this is global I mean whether Africa or um, the Aztecs or the Olmecs or the Greeks or the um, Eskimos or whatever else or the Indians I mean Look at these cultures, they lived by their myth. And they made life both plausible and beautiful to live because the mythical world was alive. And the modern world has killed myth. And in killing myth, it has dehydrated one part of itself. If the human mind can sustain that source from which new myths can be created, there is hope. There is hope like, you know, the hope that comes in um, those war n novels of uh, um, the Czech writer Karl Čapek. Hmm? You know Čapek's thing, R U R N. So he creates at the end of this terrible civilization, I mean, he creates that there's a it's not a myth, but that when, if there is love, there is possibility of a future. And never forget that those two characters, I mean, the whole of this um, mechanical civilization is, or um, society is dying, and then only these two robots are left. And everything has been programmed. Only what has not been programmed is smiling or love. And then they have this tremendous scare that they also don't know what it is to face death. And then they look at each other and one happens to be programmed as a boy and the other as a woman. And they smile and there is love. Worshipping rivers, going to mountain shrines, going to temples where there are the confluences of rivers, which is what the texts speak of. Sacredness does not lie in outer ritual. Sacredness lies in my establishing that it continues to be sacred by my making it pure and my being pure. And therefore, it is essential that part of my, whatever we call this, wor worship is not confined to small ritual of morning and evening. It must extend to the fact that I keep the river water clean, that I throw no litter in it, that I throw no affluence in it, that I leave no litter in the Himalayas which I go to worship, that I keep my ocean clean, that I keep the air clean, only then am I worshipping. Would the human being be there if there wasn't the natural environment? To my mind, 
one of the most fundamental things of a world view, especially in India and the culture to which I belong, was that man was one amongst all life. Also that there was a connection between inorganic and organic life. What modern science is telling us today about the principles of mutation, where matter can become energy and energy can become matter, intuitively or speculatively, the Upanishads articulate this all the time. And in such a situation, where I am but a speck of a much, much larger universe, and my life is dependent on this, what we call the natural environment, is I think that unless I have a sense of both humility as also a sacredness towards this natural environment, I cannot survive. If I don't look after it, it is at my peril. And it's only man's arrogance, man's or human being's arrogance, which appropriates upon itself the prerogative of thinking that he can control the environment. And we know that in the last 100 or 150 years, what man has done with the environment, where he has brought the globe to, And this relationship is basic. And it is an indispensable given of the human condition. I feel very strongly about this. <laughs>